I'm Marianne Frazier from Penn State University and I uh, collaborate with a lot of other people from our, particularly from our university, the Center for Pollinator Research, and with people from other institutions as well. And um, the kind of work we do is looking at the impacts of pesticides on honeybees and uh, sometimes other pollinators as well and um, also look at um, how we can improve honeybee health by looking at the colonies that are being successful uh, at gaining weight and overwintering uh, and what factors, particularly landscape factors, contribute to that. And I collaborate with Christina Grosinger and a number of her students uh, on that project and also work um, with a number of people on a project in Kenya, including Kenyans, <laughs> we collaborate with Kenyans, to uh, look at um, the effect of varroa mites and uh, other factors uh, on the health of bees in Africa. And uh, that's a fascinating project because bees in Africa are essentially wild bees and um, how they are responding to diseases and pests is very different than the way our bees uh, so having been involved with bees and, and, and beekeepers for more than 30-ish years, um, yeah, I have seen a big change in beekeeping. Uh, we, you know, traditionally it has been, uh, beekeepers have been older white males and um, there's been a lot of concern in that community that we, you know, that beekeepers were wanting to have more involvement by, by younger people, more diverse people. And that's happened, actually. It's it, because of uh, CCD uh, and the awareness that it's created about uh, the plight of, of, of honeybees, there's been a renaissance in beekeeping. And so we've seen a lot of young people come to beekeeping, a lot of women uh, come into beekeeping, uh, more people of color, and so that's been very, very exciting. It's also created some interesting um, challenges and uh, conflicts among uh, beekeeping groups. Uh, there is the old guard that have a lot of experience and, and uh, have seen a lot. And then there are these new, very enthusiastic young people who are coming in and want to uh, shake things up. And uh, both things, it's good, it's wonderful, it's exciting. And it's what we wanted, you know, in, in, in beekeeping. But yet it's it's still, there's a, a little bit of, and we shouldn't expect it to be anything other than there to be a little bit of conflict and challenges and differences of opinion. And uh, I think that's part of the process, part of the process of making this transition. And um, it's exciting. It's an exciting time to be in this area and to see the transition. I think we have to be open uh, and tolerant of each other. I think that's really important. Oh yeah. No, I think urban beekeeping is very exciting. And um, in our uh, work with pesticides, um, looking at, we have limited data on this, but the data is pretty exciting. We've done some studies in Marin County, California, and also in Pittsburgh. And we have a number of samples supplied to us from beekeepers who are concerned about their bees for one reason or another. Um, and we found that uh, the pesticide loads in urban colonies typically is far less uh, than beekeeper, than, be, than bees uh, that are, um, those particularly that are used for, for uh, pollination, commercial hives that are being used for pollination. I mean, it's, it's not surprising um, that we do see high levels of pesticides uh, in the colonies that are being used for pollination because they're going from crop to crop to crop and it turns out the bees are very good at scouring the environment, picking up things that are in the environment and bringing them back to the hive. Um, but in urban settings we thought maybe we would see higher high levels again of, of pesticides because of, of uh, there is a fair amount of use of pesticides by a lot of people in urban areas who don't want dandelions or clover in their pristine green lawns, um, who are basically a little uh, insect, you know, ento, uh, insect uh, phobic, and so um, reach for the pesticides um, maybe, you know, more often than they, they should. But in reality, in the few places, and admittedly it is limited data, um, we have been excited about the, uh, the the lack of pesticides that we've seen in urban environments. So we're very, very thankful for that. And I think it's very exciting that, you know, people in urban environments have the most contact with other people. 
And so whenever they are keeping bees in urban environments and are excited about their bees, they're going to be sharing that with other people. So anything that helps us educate people about the importance of bees, the importance of pollination, the, the, the struggle that beekeepers and farmers are having in terms of producing the food that we all go to the grocery store and consume, any information, any, any you know, good, solid, uh, accurate information that gets out there about the food supply um, is really important. And so I think urban beekeepers can play a really, really, really important role in um, helping people who aren't so close to and connected to our, our food supply understand the challenges and the importance of, uh, of, of, of what farmers, and I include beekeepers in that, are, are, are doing. So I think urban beekeeping is, is, is very exciting and um, hugely important. Yeah, my hope for the future of beekeeping is that bees are going to actually, bees and beekeepers, and bees in, in, in particular, are going to help us to understand that um, perhaps the way that we are um, approaching the, the production of food and um, uh, not only food but fiber and, and seed, for instance, uh, is not sustainable in the long run and that um, we have got to find more effective ways uh, of controlling pests and also producing um, the quantities and quality of food that we are accustomed to, to uh, having. Um, I think co consumers don't recognize too that they're part of this cycle. This, this uh, We are asking farmers, when we go to the grocery store and we pick out the perfect apple, the perfect ear of corn without a you know, bit of insect damage, um, lettuce that has no, no insect damage, uh, that we won't tolerate that. That the message that we send to farmers is that we, we, the only way to produce that kind of food that has no pathogen damage and has no, no pest damage is to use pesticides. And so we need to be more tolerant as consumers. We need to be more tolerant of insect damage and pathogen damage to our food um, as long as it's not unhealthy and, and for the most part it, you know it's not. Uh, there are issues around storage of food and so forth and trying to eliminate some of the, the, the damage to uh, or the pa pathogen and pest damage because of, of the storage of food but we can certainly tolerate more than we do and um, that would send a huge message to growers that we are you know we are going to be accepting of that and the message send, sending the message then that we don't have to have these perfect fruits and perfect vegetables it's okay and to, to use less pesticides and for us to accept more in the way of, of, of insect and pest damage I think that's really important for consumers to understand that they're a part of this cycle of, of constant pesticide use this chemical treadmill that we're on when I was a senior in high school a long, long time ago and um, uh, ready to begin my career as an undergraduate student, I was at a youth conservation camp and uh, I met a woman who was a camp counselor at the time who had bees and she was very, very excited that her brother had captured a swarm of bees, one of her hives had swarmed and uh, captured that swarm and brought it home and hived it. And I thought this was crazy. Why would anybody collect a swarm of bees? Isn't that very dangerous? And um, you know, why would you have bees to begin with? And uh, so for the next hour, I drilled her about these kinds of things. People keeping bees, why do you do it? Uh, about the biology of bees. And she told me things in that conversation that uh, I didn't believe, like bees could dance to communicate information and that they could make new queens but from, from worker bees, basically worker larvae, from things, the food that they feed them, uh, many, many things like this. And so I thought, uh, I don't believe her, I'm going to find out more about bees someday. And I was just really curious. And so when I was a junior in college, I found out that they have a course at Penn State on beekeeping. And so I took that course and I got just enthusiastic and, and fell in love with bees and went on and got my master's degree in entomology specializing in apiculture. My advisor said to me, you'll never work in this field as a woman and there are just so few jobs. 
and when I got out, I uh, finished with my degree, my two-year master's degree. I went to Maryland and became the assistant state apiary inspector. And then I got a job in Sudan for two and a half years working with bees and beekeepers. And then I came to Penn State, back to Penn State for a very short period of time because I wanted to do more international work and uh, ended up being there for 26 years. So um, worked with Clarence Collison and he left and became the um, head of the Department of Entomology at Mississippi State. And so I ended up staying there and, and working. And now I get to teach the course that I took that helped me, you know, develop my love for beekeeping. And I get to go back to Africa and now work in Africa. So it's funny how things come full circle sometimes. And so I'm very, very blessed with uh, the life I've had and the work I've been able to do with bees and beekeepers.